to us, destination marketing is not about tourism. It's about economic development and the betterment of your own community. We're just doing it through tourism and, and through meetings and conventions and so on. Okay, guys, since we started the Destination Marketing Podcast a little over a year ago, I've had several destinations reach out and say, hey, could you help me start a podcast? And at first we were kind of like, well, no, that's not really what we do. But after enough requests, we said, you know what, let's explore this. And we've created a turnkey program for destinations where we will produce, we will host, we will edit, and we will publish your podcast for your destination on a weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly basis. Uh, And all you have to do is show up and answer some questions. Uh, We're really excited about this program. We've got a few destinations that have been doing really, really well with their podcasts. Uh, And if you've ever thought about creating a podcast for your destination, but you don't have all the equipment or you don't have uh, the the expertise or, or any of that type of stuff, let us take that off your hands. Let, let Relic handle your podcast creation and production. And all you have to do is show up and answer questions about all the amazing things there are to do within your destination. So let me know if you're interested. Email me at adam at relicagency.com and we'll get you set up on this podcast program. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Destination Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Stoker. We've got a great show for you today. Uh, It's a destination that uh, it's on my list. I haven't been there in person yet, but it's been fun to learn about this destination over the last couple of weeks. And uh, we have with us Patrick Harrison from Tampa Bay, Florida. Patrick, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Adam. It's good to be here. Hopefully, I'll be as entertaining as uh, the last few guests you've had. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I can't pick favorites, uh, and so uh, we won't tell you if you're not, but uh, we'll <laughs> we'll look at the numbers. <laughs> All right. Well, well, thanks for coming on. We've got a couple of questions that we like to ask everybody right at the be- beginning just to get the conversation going. First, I've got to know, and, and you're well-traveled, so this might be hard, but if there's Anywhere in the world you could go, what's your dream destination? Cool, that, that is a tough question. Um, you know, I have, I've lived in quite a few countries and I've been very fortunate to visit a whole bunch. Um, I, I do tend to love cities and history more um, than beaches, probably because I live in the sunshine. So when I go on vacation, I, I get away from it. So I like you know, London, New York, Berlin. Um, I think right now I, my, my wife's Russian. So if I don't say Moscow, and I haven't been there yet, she would kill me. So I'll go with <laughs> Moscow, but also in a COVID-19 world. And I know I said not so much the sunshine, but you know those pictures you see of those little beach huts out in uh, Bali or Tahiti that are out in the ocean? Yes. That that looks really good right now. Socially distancing from, from the rest of the world right there. That sounds perfect. You know what? And, and you're not alone because uh, I think travelers today uh, are, are now looking for ways that they can social distance, which which to me is a little concerning for some of the destinations that you mentioned, like, you know, New York, uh, London and, and some of the other more densely populated or densely traveled destinations. You know, it's it's changing the way people look at their getaways. I think it is, you know, but right now, because we're still in the midst of this this health crisis, you know, it's one of those where people are looking at things different in the way they did. But, you know, tourism and travel is is resilient. And if you remember, you know, after 9-11, everyone stopped traveling and then they came back. Oh, yeah. After the, uh, you know, the crash in, in 2008, 2009, everyone stopped traveling and it came back. You know, I think once we get this thing under control, once people uh, learn to take some personal responsibility and stop acting like adolescents, or once we get at some kind of vaccine or, or uh, antibody that we all feel is effective, I think people will get over this fairly quickly. I know that sounds at the moment tough to believe, but throughout history, that's exactly what's happened. So I have no doubt that these places are going to see some uh, folks coming back. I mean... Uh, you look at New York now. I mean, their numbers are down. I mean, the, the only reason they're not getting more travelers is because they won't let us in at this stage. So the minute that, that we get things under control, we'll be back there again. 
Yeah, you know, I, I think you're totally right, and, and I love that you bring the perspective of the previous crises uh, that that have happened. And you know, I can't remember who I was talking to recently, but uh, we have a generation of people in the destination marketing industry that didn't go through 9/11 or the the Great Recession uh, as as part of their careers, and so they're they've experienced ten years of sustained growth without actually experiencing a crisis. Right. And, but, but those that have been through it before, the, the travel industry always comes back. And not only does it come back, it gets to record highs every time it continues to grow. And I think that's a good perspective to have as you're looking at this crisis. Yeah, everything is cyclical. You know, it's not just the travel industry. It's everything, you know, you, you can't just keep on going up, up, up forever. And yeah, we've had, um, you know, record quarter after record quarter, even, even going into February of this year was our best February in forever. And we were about to host WrestleMania and a bunch of other stuff. And the rest of the year looked like it was just going to be so good and so off the charts. And we were so proud of ourselves. Well, you know, sometimes you need a, a slap in the face to, to take you back to square one and, and make sure that you, you do things right. Well, we definitely all got that slap in the face for, <laughs> for sure. Uh, well, Patrick, before we go any further, I think we've kind of gotten ahead of ourselves here. I still need to know your favorite trip you've ever been on. Oh, gosh, that's that's tough. Uh, again, I mean, I lived in uh, Sydney, Australia. I, I honeymooned in St. Petersburg, Russia. I took the kids to San Francisco last year. To me, though, I... I, I, I I just there's something maybe because I'm English or was English. Um, there's something about London. Every time just being in London, every time I get the chance to go back to London, I, I discover new things and you know the history and uh, the bars and the nightlife and everything else. I think t- to me that's still that's still the place that beckons me. Give us give us an experience uh, from London, a little nugget that could maybe uh, you know help us move London up our list. Well, there's a couple of places I, t- I tend to take people when we're over there on business trips if they haven't been before, and they're, they're right next to each other. There's a uh, bar on uh, Embankment right down by the river um, by Embankment Tube Station called Gordon's, and it's only sells wine and port, no beer, no nothing else, and it's been there forever. And you go down into the cellars, and the cellars probably haven't been cleaned in over 100 years but that's where you buy the drinks, and it is just so emblematic of, uh, of the UK. And then right up the street from that, not that I, I haven't got a track record of drinking, but there's another bar uh, called um, uh, the James Joyce, and that's where during, um, uh, oh, we're going back like three or 400 years now, that's where Samuel Pepys wrote his Diaries of London. Uh, sorry, it's not called the James Joyce. I don't know why I said that. It's called the Nell Gwynn, named after the... Uh, um, mistress of uh, charles ii okay. so it's again very old several hundred years old the ceilings are about five feet high and if you uh have had a f- couple of drinks and you try and get to the bathrooms which are down some very steep and narrow stairs you better be careful because you're going to probably bang your head on the ceiling man okay sounds like a couple of great places to check out uh, when we go to london that's good stuff you'll, you'll enjoy it trust me okay all right i like it well, tell us a little bit about you, Patrick, and, and your background and how you got into tourism. Uh, well, I started out actually wanting to be a, a journalist and, you know, did that for a couple of different newspapers. You know, I think we all saw the writing on the wall early that that was not going to be a growing uh, long-term career. I actually switched into public relations, worked in, in London for a few years and then came over to Florida, ended up. Uh, being part owner of an advertising and uh, PR agency in Tampa and uh, not really in tourism. I mean, of course, if you're in Florida, you're always going to have some kind of tourism clients, but it was really more uh, um, alcohol, wine and spirits, and, and uh, plus you know, some other industries. In uh, 08, 09, when uh, you know, everything crashed, our agency, we merged into a bigger one, and that their forte was uh, and still is uh, tourism and hospitality marketing. So here I was living in uh, Tampa, uh, representing five or six different destinations, you know, within the state and and Caribbean, and uh, you know, but I wasn't in Tampa. So I did you know, probably about ten years of, of Florida-based tourism before I uh, got an opportunity to switch into to visit Tampa Bay and, and this position. 
Wow, great stuff. Okay, so and your current role at Visit Tampa Bay, Chief Marketing Officer. Chief Marketing Officer. Okay, perfect. Well, sounds, so you've sounds, been on- sounds very big and 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 official and so on, but but we're only a small, you know, small group. So it's not like I'm overseeing thousands of people. So basically, we're hundreds. Just, well, yeah, uh, we basically just you know really <laughs> tight a tight knit team that I get to uh, uh, take responsibility for. Good stuff. Well, you've had the opportunity to sit on both sides of the table as an agency and as a destination. Tell me a little bit about the you know advantages, disadvantages, or or experiences that come along with with having been on both sides. Um, well, I mean, there's a, there are advantages to both. I mean, I think to me, um, you know, I, I don't know if I'm slightly ADHD or I'm just easily bored or have very little patience. Um, but what I liked about the agency side was the, the juggling of, of several clients, and it was always there was always something going on. There was always something uh, new and, and creative, and and I, I never thought I would be able to really move away from that. I think though, after twenty odd years of, of, of doing things on that side, I thought the opportunity to give you know a hundred percent of my attention to one cause would be something I really wanted to try and see. Um, and I think it, we're probably we're a little different here than, than most destinations, as uh, at least in the state of Florida. And you know, we're we're not part of the county government. We're a, a private five hundred one c six, not for profit. Okay. So we don't have the some of the hindrances or challenges that they do. I mean, I don't have to answer to a to a county government. So basically, we can operate just like uh, an ad agency. You know, we can decide what we want to do. We can be high speed. We can be highly creative. We're research focused. We can beta test things. We can do things that nobody else ever done before. And we can make that decision in an instance, just like you can when you sat on the other side. And I think that, so that I think was great to be able to bring the knowledge of how things work in an agency into what is in effect uh, an in-house agency, which is what we have now. Of course, the, the fun part is, at least for me, and maybe not so for our agencies of record, is that I know exactly how they operate. So, uh, you know, I understand on the benefit side for them, I understand their needs and their processes and how, how uh, quickly they think, you know, we need to turn things around. But I also know agency BS when I see it. So, you know, it gives me an opportunity. So, you know, basically, they, they will, I've all learned very quickly not to try and, and BS me because I, I will call them on it. And, I, you know, to me, I think maybe that's just getting led to a stronger relationship. Yeah, you know, I, I, I like that you have the ability to understand what they need from you. To You've seen it from their side of the table, so you know how to make their life easier and how to help them help you. But at the same time, you also know how to see through uh, something when, when it might not be right or, or, or when you're not exactly uh, getting blown away by, by the performance. And, and I think that's a really good perspective to have because so many destination marketers end up using an agency – and that perspective would be so helpful for so many people. I think you're right. And, and I think that, I mean, there's, a, there's several things it brings to the table. And the, the fact that the relationship can be different. Uh, you know, they, they, we, we discussed early on, you know, I, if I brought in these specific agencies or through RFP processes because I wanted their expertise, things that were outside of what we can do internally, we need their strengths. The last thing we want from an agency is somebody who wants to just do whatever I want, uh, just to keep the the contract. You know, I mean, you bring you, the whole point of hiring, whether it's a person or a group, is is to add to the equation, is to is to add to the whole and make everything exponentially better. So I think that was you know, it was good that we could have those discussions, and I think they understood because I knew their their processes and how things worked that I was really being honest, and I'm, I'm not here just to make myself look good. The, we, what we're looking for is the end result. So if I have a bad idea, tell me, you know, it's, it's, it's the way it should be. So you bring up an interesting point that I think, I think there's a lot of tourism destinations that may have a, a yes man agency, right? And my, my question is, how do you have that conversation with the agency? If, if, if you're worried that your agency might just be telling you yes all the time to keep the contract, how do you open up those lines of communication? 
Um, you know, I, I think you have to begin very early on, with, as you do with any uh, even inter-office um, business relationship. You know, you you got to show that you're you have some integrity, that you're an honest person, that you're not um, that it's not your way or the highway, and you got to ask questions. I, I ask our agency questions all the time. They ask us questions all the time. I think it, it's only by working. It's by only by having very open discussions, and of course, you know, let's come. A lot of this does come back to to personalities. We actually have a really good agency, uh, two really good agencies right now. Our agency of record is uh, FKQ here in in Tampa Bay. We also work with Mad Media out in Arizona, and it's just one of those things. That's, over times, you know, we, we know that they're the people that they have there. We trust their ability. We trust in what they are seeing. We know that the things that they're bringing to us are based in, in research. We know what, the, what their capabilities are. And they've seen from us, in, in both cases now, we've been working together over four years, they've seen the same response from me and from, from my team and internally here. It's, we know what's within each other's capabilities. We know that we don't have to lie to each other or manipulate situations to get what we want. So it's, it is a very... Um, very open situation. And th- those are the, the ways that agencies stay with a client for a long time, you know, it, it's especially in our business. And I, and I don't know whether, you know, I can't speak for, for other groups, uh, other destinations, because agencies I have worked for represent lots of those agencies. And and we had some similar uh, relationships there too. It's just, you know, it does, It's a lot of it is, is human character and, you know how confident people are in them in themselves. How self assured they are. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, good advice. Good advice for everybody that that's working with an agency, as as many destinations end up needing to. Let's let's back up and talk about Tampa Bay, though. Uh, Tampa Bay is a unique destination. You've alluded to it a little bit, but give us kind of the general overview of Tampa as a destination. Well, it's interesting because I think if you haven't been here in the last four or five years, or if you've only you know just been through our uh, airport on the way to somewhere else, I don't think you quite grasp about what this destination is. You know, we are not like um, the rest of Florida. Really, it's we don't have a beach, uh, although we are very close to many of the best beaches in uh, in the state. We don't have one within our county borders. Uh, and we don't have Mickey Mouse or Universal. So, you know, we have to do things a little bit differently. We do have some attractions. You know, we have a great Bush Gardens, uh, Zoo Tampa, Florida Aquarium. But I think we really see things. We're a Florida destination that's more like like Denver or Austin or maybe even uh, Brooklyn. where you know, a little bit urban, a little bit different, a little bit hip. You know, you're going to see more guys with full sleeve tattoos than you are in, uh, you know, Miami Vice outfits. So it's it's really more of that kind of style we have um really the whole city came back to life uh, in the last five or six years or maybe even seven or eight years now when we revitalized our waterfront uh, the tampa river walk which is about two and a half miles and flows through downtown and includes museums hotels restaurants parks we have a pirate water taxi that goes out down there people kayak cycle We've got a great uh, food and uh, a craft beer scene like a lot of people have now. But the other thing we have that we bring to the table that other Florida destinations don't have for the most part is history. You know, uh, Ybor City uh, in Tampa is well over 100 and something years old. And that's where the cigar industry uh, was in the U.S. in the 20th century. That's where a lot of the, the mafia influences were uh, back in the, the 30s and 40s. You know, Sonny Traficante, who ran uh, Ybor City's mafia, supposedly was behind uh, the Kennedy assassination. He's one of those guys that had to run from Havana when Castro took over. So we've got a lot of that Cuban uh, history, a lot of that very different kind of funky stuff than you would see in, in pretty much anywhere else in, in Florida you know, outside of St. Augustine and Tampa, there aren't many buildings that are more than about 30 or 40 years old in, the, in this state. Wow. Wow. Sounds like diverse product, diverse attractions, diverse history. Uh, you know, there's pros and cons to that in, in, in being in charge of marketing the destination because, yes, you've got a wonderful product to market, but you also have a lot of different uh, attractions and stakeholders to show love to. 
We do, and we are a partner-based organization, so or member-based. You know, we have almost eight hundred companies, uh, from hotels to museums to you know, mom and pop limo companies. You name it; they're all part of us. And it, it would be uh, easier, I suppose, if we had one image that we could get behind. But you know, where's the fun in that as a marketer? If you if you've got one thing, then your job's done for you. I think from from our perspective, it was more of a case of, well, what do we have? We actually, with our attractions, uh, have more roller coasters than any other uh, place in Florida, including the the major theme parks of Orlando. Uh, We actually have more breweries, craft breweries, than any other, uh, last count, uh, than any other destination in, in the state. We have lots of things that we are the most of. So that's actually how we came up with our ad campaign right now, which is Florida's most. So we can then tag uh, whatever we may want to get in there or whatever images that we could talk about Florida's most culture and show our Cuban culture in Ybor City. Or uh, right now, because of you know the COVID uh, uh, situation where we're really trying to show fresh air and outsides, we're really talking about Florida's most wide open opportunities or Florida's most breaths of fresh air. So it's really been that uh, actually award-winning tag or award-winning campaign that really has united all the disparate pieces of, of, of the community, of, of the tourism community. It's actually been, it was a, we've been running that now about, uh, oh, probably about four, four and a half years. And it, it's been, was hugely successful until about three months ago. So we're hoping, <laughs> we're hoping it will be again. Well, you know what? It sounds like a great campaign. And on top of that, you, you mentioned COVID. And I want to dive into how Tampa has approached COVID and, and how you've tackled it as a destination. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll dive into that. Today's episode is brought to you by Relic. As many of you know, I own an advertising agency called Relic, and we work specifically with tourism destinations. If there's any of you that are struggling with what to do next, or you've tried agencies that don't specialize in tourism, or, or if you've been using the local flavor for years and years and you're just looking for something new, I would say give us a call. Give us the opportunity to take a look at your plan, see what you're doing, use our tourism knowledge and industry specialty to examine everything from your brand to your tactical execution and make recommendations of how to help. We'll do that assessment for free. We'll give you those recommendations for free. And if you like what we say, maybe you can hire us to to execute on those plans. So kind of a risk-free opportunity to have us take a holistic look at everything you're doing, provide some recommendations, and you can kind of see us in action. If you're interested in having us do something like that, please send me an email directly at adam at relicagency.com. I would love to set that up with my team. Okay, Patrick, let's let's talk about COVID. Uh, one of the things that I really wanted to have you talk about when you came on is Tampa as a destination was really proactive. And, you know, you mentioned several of the things that you guys did to be proactive. Let's talk about some of those. Well, it's a good point to bring up, you know, and I'm sure there were many other destinations that um, um, did similar activities. In fact, you know, when I I see things in newsletters and online pieces now, I I can see that a lot of great minds were thinking along similar um, paths. There was a lot of, um, you know, um, videos that were produced, you know, we'll be ready when you are and all of those kind of methods. But really, for us, what we did immediately was i guess we d- we decided to stop being a destination marketing organization and, and to be uh, a community uh, support and community outreach company you know as i said we have 800 odd partners and there are thousands of other businesses here that you know we, we communicate with too we really wanted to start giving them daily updates of where where things stood we really started doing a lot more client outreach phone calls obviously a lot of people were being furloughed and laid hey, off let me let me ask you a quick question there, Patrick. So on these daily updates, how, how did you do that? Was that through email, social media, uh, all of the above? Both. We actually um, we have an email database for partners and you know for people who've signed up for newsletters and updates. Plus also, though, we used all of our social media channels. We have uh, obviously Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We have a Twitter account that goes under our CEO's name, Um we, and then we started working with some other local destinations on, on other Facebook groups, 
really because we knew if people are laid off, they're probably less likely to get in their work email or less likely to be answering some of their emails. But social media was where people tended to be flocking for information. And, you know, there was so much and still is so much incorrect and bad information out there. We really wanted to be able to... uh, get a forum going where people could ask us questions, where we could answer things on the fly. And, you know, the situation, especially in the first couple of months of COVID, was so fluid, you know, from one day to the next. It was, you know, what is this the best thing to be doing? Is this the best thing to be doing? Oh, God, don't do that, even though we told you to do it yesterday. So it was really more from from updates as often as we could do. And, you know, from even from our hoteliers and, and, and attractions, you know, they, they laid off and, and furloughed a lot of their staff too. So then we really stepped in, I think, to be more of um, a support to them. We, we became, especially our convention sales team and our leisure sales teams, really became more of, a, of, of the outreach. They became more of the sales operations for a lot of our attractions to, to keep that communication going. So I, I hear that. And, you know, to me, I'm glad that you mentioned that you're a, a partner-based organization because... I think there's a lot of different types of DMOs and structures of DMOs. And, you know, for you, you've got these partners that are that are paying into having you represent them as the DMO. And so what an important time for you guys to step up and demonstrate the value they're getting from that partnership. And and I've never heard of a destination actually chipping in and taking over bandwidth from hotel partners that need it and, and actually taking that leap across the line and, and helping them sell those rooms. I mean, obviously you sell the destination, uh, but it sounds like you guys really went kind of above and beyond to help these businesses that are struggling through the crisis remain partners that strengthen your destination as a whole. Well, I think it's, it's important to look at, at where we stand, uh, what type of organization we are at, at, at our heart. You know, we, we are... Um, We've worked very closely with the, these partners and with this community for a very long time. You know, to us, the destination marketing, it's not about tourism. It's, it's about economic development and the betterment of your own community. We're just doing it through tourism and, and through meetings and conventions and so on. So we've developed over years a trust that there is they, the county and the city and other partners come to us with questions, they may it may be outside of our normal remit, but we will get involved in whatever it needs to be that is for the betterment of our uh, community. So it, it made complete sense if if our convention sales team is already going out there trying to save or reschedule meetings or to work with hotels on you know, what availability they have, what can we do? I mean, bear in mind some hotels, as you you know, and in, in a lot of different destinations, closed at least temporarily, some were taken over as overflow uh, hospitals, you know, this and this was happening all over the place. So really, it was about working with all of those different units to find out what their needs were at that particular time, and how we could benefit them. And it was different in, in nearly every case. But that's to us is, is the vital and important piece. Because when all this is over, and we are back to uh, what will hopefully be a much better situation, they'll remember that. Even some of those that may not survive, they may come back into other business lines, but they'll remember that we were there for them and we didn't run and hide, or that's at least what I hope they do. Yeah, you know, Patrick, I'm of the belief that the work that needed to happen to facilitate the type of action your organization took happened long before COVID ever hit because you guys had to decide – who you are as an organization, who you are as a partner, and what your role is in the community. And then when when the crisis hit, it wasn't, okay, what do we do now? Because of the values and the role that you had established had been established long before. I mean, you're right. I mean, we all, or I hope everybody out there has, you know, a crisis plan. And it probably doesn't include pandemic. I know ours didn't, but, you know, the crisis plan is is, is similar no matter what the situation would be. But you're right. I mean, we have a, a CEO and a board who feel it's very important that we are community-minded. We've spent years building that. And you're right. It's like we, so when this happened, even though we, you know, we were closing down our offices temporarily and all, you know, beginning that commute to living on on Zoom calls, just as everybody else is doing. 
we had the the steps in place, the communication tools in place. We had the 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 lists and the knowledge and the relationships with with our various partners that we we could very quickly get things up and running and and start moving forwards again. And you know, being a Florida destination, you know, everybody in Florida has a a, a, a decent crisis plan. We we do tend to have these regular summer uh, weather events and other, other things going along. So, you know, maybe, you know, we're, we're, we're all a little better prepared or, um, you know, we've been through similar situations before. So when something bad does happen, we don't all, you know, freak out and run around in circles. We, it's just open up the binder, turn to page one. Here we go. Let's, uh, let's see what we can. Obviously this, is uh, you know something we've never had to go through before, um, but I, I don't want to be like a politician who starts patting himself on the back or saying we've done a good job. But I think our community and our partners will feel that we have been uh, by their side and have, have tried to be as as uh, proactive as, as possible. Awesome, awesome. Okay, you talked about. Uh, your recovery campaign. You guys launched your recovery campaign on June fifteenth. Tell me, tell me about how you kind of prepared to launch that campaign, and then tell me what what happened to kind of get in the way of it. Um, well, I, you know, our usual summer campaigns focus on our, our in-state or drive markets. We're no different from just about any other Florida destination. Like there's only a couple, say, you know, Miami, that revolves more around international travel than than the rest of us. So it's really more of the drive market anyway. So really, it was more of an extension of, of that market. But also, you know, technology has changed so much over the past few years. We now we have so many uh, partners and vendors, whether it's you know Adara, Arrivalist, Conversant, uh, working with the OTAs, you know, the Expedias and the, and the price lines of the world. We get a lot more research now, so we can really see where people are coming from, how they're responding. We can really you know dive down because. If we take about, if we go demographics, right? We used to know what our audience, what who our audience was. Our audience, I uh, mean, not to put exactly a fine point on it, but our audience was predominantly female, late thirties to early forties. We knew their household income. We knew all of that kind of stuff, just as I'm sure all of our, you know, neighboring destinations do. So that's gone out of the window. Now there's two groups. There's two. There's two groups, and that's it. There is the group that's ready to travel. And the group that's locked to the front door and they're not leaving the house for the next six months. So really, it's it's a whole new world that tends to be more. Uh, I, I, I just saw some research again this morning um, from a, um, from Brand USA that's showing that it is now skewing instead of being female heavy with uh, being the the demo, it's male heavy. It's it's really going more of a male demographic. So that's all changed. So we had a plan in place. We launched June fifteenth. All the numbers were stable. Everything looked good. July 1st, 2nd, right before July 4th weekend, obviously everything went crazy again. You know, uh, Florida, Texas, California, some others uh, shot through the roof. Obviously, right now, uh, those are the, the poster children for, for the epidemic. Um, so we really, but from June 15th to July 1, huge response. Just showed the pent-up demand that was out there, the numbers of bookings we had. You know, if, even if you look at our OTA uh, booking windows now, it's it's like two days, one day. I mean, people just want to get out wow. and go. It's it's very fast. It's very quick. So our initial results were hugely in, in encouraging. Um, so then we really had to start putting the brakes on. Um, not on everything. I mean, we, you know, you have to do some of the long term stuff. Your SEO, or SEM, all of these things have to keep going. We've kept some campaigns running with. Uh, Expedia Priceline, we're doing some stuff with uh, Dora. Everything is highly, highly um, tracked. And what's interesting is that the uh, numbers are holding. So we can only consider how good the numbers would be if you know the, the uh, COVID cases had stayed flat. So it's, it is hopeful. Uh, challenge is going to be now, I mean, we're probably guessing it's going to probably be 12 or 18 months before we get back to where we were. So now it's just, uh, you know, working uh, to, to see how quickly we can get there and, and hoping things stabilize. 
You know, you mentioned something there that piqued my interest, and and you said that you're starting to see that males are booking the trips more than females, and that's different from the way it was before. How did you discover that, and, you know, how do you action on that? Well, we we do track, as I said, a a lot of things now that, you know, maybe uh, 10 years ago uh, you you couldn't track, you know, uh, credit card usage, uh, cell phone usage, um, but also, you know, just consumer sentiment um, surveys, um, which are really showing a big skew right now, you know, and I'm sure psychologists could tell you more about gender differences and mindsets, but I think, you know, it seems to be maybe the men are more uh, open right now. To getting out, I did see a piece today that it showed that uh, you know people who were in the more uh, heavily affected areas were more open to getting out. Um, you know, it's it's amazing how it's how mindsets uh, go. But no, so we we track we we you know track credit card spending trends on travel, cell phones pinging points of interest, um, consumer sentiment data from four or five different people. It's very little we don't know about our audiences. Uh, uh, today compared to where we were, but it does make it much easier for us to aim at those um, travel and tenders and be more specific rather than targeting, you know, mass media, cable or TV, which we, we don't do a lot of that stuff anyway, but right now we're really not in those marketplaces. And, and just because we know that for once that statement's about 50% of your advertising being wasted would be true. Yeah, you know, I love that statement. <laughs> you know, a, a lot of people say that that you know, fifty percent of their marketing budget is wasted. They just don't know which fifty percent, right? <laughs> well, that's the old phrase, right? Well, you know, because you know, you, you throw a you throw an ad in a certain medium, and you know, you're talking mass market. Um, we were never a, a, a destination that did that anyway, because we don't have the huge budgets of uh, of some of our others. And I know there are some Florida ones that are and, and probably around the country who are jealous of the budgets we we did have. Um, but you know, compared to some of the other bigger destinations, we don't have a lot, so we have to be careful. We can't uh, we can't just throw large m- amounts of money to all. We'll beta test. I'll beta test just about anything if we think that there's uh, there's going to be uh, something at the end of end of it. In fact, that's actually how we tend to work with some of the really uh, newer, uh, expensive products that are out there by volunteering through the guinea pig at uh, you know huge discounts on on the. Uh, on the rate. Gotcha. Well, and smart to do that, to be willing to, to test new technologies, new products. And, and that's, I mean, that's how you find what, what can separate you from your competitors that might have a larger budget. Well, exactly. And we know we do have that. I mean, uh, we are surrounded by several large beach destinations. Um, also, obviously, Orlando and, and Kissimmee and, and their theme parks are right next door to us as well. I mean, it's Florida's not that big a state. I can go from one side to the other in a couple of hours. So, you know, we, and I, I would say it sounds like I'm uh, uber competitive with these folks, but I, I will give them credit. Going back, going back to how we, um, we we move forward in response to the pandemic is that we got together a group of all of our neighboring uh, uh, destinations down the Gulf Coast of Florida and started doing weekly uh Zoom calls and making sure we were keeping each other informed on what was going on and best practices and who was ready to do this and who tried that. And I, I think for the long term or for the long haul, I think that is really going to benefit all the destinations in the state. I think we have now become much more coordinated and much more complementary. Yeah, at the end of the day, I still want people to stay in one of my hotels versus somebody else's hotel. But if they stay in at least one of our hotels, then that's better than not getting any of them. And so I think that regional approach right now uh, in the wake of uh, COVID is is probably the best way to go. Yeah, I like the collaboration there. Uh, you know, Patrick, this has been really insightful. And I just want to ask you, you know, we have we have destination listeners around the world and all of them are navigating the same challenge right now. If you could boil uh, kind of your comments today into a, a clear takeaway for destinations of of kind of your main piece of advice, what would that be? You know, I've, I think I, even going back to when I was a journalist or in PR, I used to say there, there are a couple of things you need to have to be successful in this uh, business because you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You know, you, you do have to surround yourself with smart people who who have abilities and knowledge that you don't. You do have to have some creativity and you do need some common sense because you don't want to walk into 
bizarre situations. But you also have to have a thick skin. You know, you have to realize that you're not always going to be successful and not everything you do is going to work. In fact, you know, I mean, you, you talk about, and so for those who are outside of the U.S. and don't know baseball analogies, you know, if you're the best hitter in baseball, that means you you missed six out of uh, ten attempts. Right. You know, you, it's it's you, you have to get the, the best pitcher in the game loses games, but you, so you just have to keep your mind on on the end game and just remember that you aren't expected to to know everything. Look look for advice. Look for mentorship. Well, that's that's great advice, Patrick. I really appreciate you coming on today and, and sharing your experience and knowledge with uh, with our audience. I think it's been a great episode. Well, I hope so because if it's if it was not as good as uh, a couple of my friends who are, or colleagues who I know have been on this, they'll be sure to remind me. <laughs> you know, we got to get a group thread going where you can rate each other. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, Th- thanks, thanks a lot, a lot for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, same to you. Well, uh, this has been another great episode of the Destination Marketing Podcast. If you enjoyed today's show with, with all the information that Patrick gave us, please make sure to leave us a rating and review. That will continue to help the podcast to grow. Thanks, everybody, and we'll talk to you next week. Okay, everybody, we've been talking a lot over the last couple of months about recovery campaigns and what that looks like. And the coronavirus has really thrown so many of us for a loop. If you have found yourself struggling to know how you're going to plan your recovery campaign, or if you're not sure if you've got the right plan in place, my team has been putting together these recovery campaigns for several destinations. We would love to take that opportunity to provide one for you. If you're interested in getting some guidance for your recovery campaign, whether it's just for us to take a look and give you some some high level recommendations or if you're looking for someone to help you see it all the way through we'd love the opportunity to take a look if you're interested in having us take a look and help you come up with the right recovery campaign please email me directly at adam at relicagency.com and we'll get you set up 